we ask, which creepy urban legend turned out to be true? I went to a university near Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. It used to be a prisoner of war camp and military hospital before the college bought the entire property for one dollar in the 1960s. Since there are only three universities near Valley Forge, it will not be hard to deduce which college it was. Anyways, there was a rumor that underground tunnels and all sorts of stuff were left abandoned in the abandoned section of the college. Sure enough, it was true. We found a tunnel hatch under our carpet in our dorm room. Two hatches on the first floor. Furthest most first floor dorm room of each building. It was literally like stepping into 1945. Everything was preserved down there and the tunnels were massive. We eventually ended up in an underground garage where there were like four jeeps parked but all the tires had drill rotted. We realized this was actually beneath our soccer field. Anyways, the tunnels led to the cafeteria, the admin building, every dorm, and the old abandoned section of our campus that we had no way of entering the top side. We soon realized this was the hospital slash morgue when we got to the tunnel and walked the floor it was still like 1945. All the hospital beds were still there, the surgical curtains were still there, hell, even the tools like scalpel, saw, and pliers still on their trays. It was like everyone all of the sudden up and left and nothing had been moved since. The morgue still had its slabs and sometimes we would dare each other to slide in there for some time. But yeah, it was an urban legend on the campus until the three of us decided to risk expulsion to see if it was true. And it was. Freddy Krueger is based on a real story. Hear me out. There's a small ethnic group located Southeast Asia, the Hamong people. They've been oppressed for years by various countries. So, they fought with the U.S. during the Vietnam Civil War. As you know, we lost and the North Vietnamese were gearing up to kill the Hmong people who had fought for the Southern Vietnamese. So the U.S. airlifted a bunch of Hmong families to the U.S., primarily in California and Minnesota. One of the recent immigrants was a young man. He was perfectly healthy, but suddenly died in his sleep. No one knew how he died. It's guessed it was a heart attack, but an autopsy was never done. This hit panic throughout the community. There's Hmong legend to a spirit that enters your dream and kills you. Hmong people were terrified. They were also in a new community without access to some old traditions to protect them. Young men started staying awake, trying to avoid this monster. They downed caffeine after caffeine and they were scared enough that it caused stress to their hearts and they died. Eventually, 117 men died from Hmong sleeping sickness. There's this road called Whippoorwill. It's either haunted or is nesting ground for the KKK, other creepy local cults. There are several articles about it on the internet. Anyways, I and two friends drove there at night and a big white Bronco came out of nowhere behind us with huge LED lights and tried to drive us off the road. A very narrow dirt road surrounded by dense trees. They were on our ass, like making us speed. A big hill came into the road. It's about a mile long and you should be going slow. When we went over the top of that Bronco stayed right behind us. Then it disappeared. It was intense. I figured they were patrolling for a cult clan meeting, but there is some truth about that urban legend. That's a fact. I went to school in a very well-to-do area, so of course, there was nothing seriously wrong with murderers. But one story particular from elementary school stands out here. There were rumors that our school had a basement under the gym floor that contained torture equipment. People described it as racks, whips, chains, etc. This was, of course, denied by absolutely everyone at the school, and of course by parents. Besides, our single-story school was built in the 1920s. How could it have a basement? Kids, of course, doubted the denial. If you jumped pretty hard on the gym floor, it sounded hollow. When I was in fifth grade, someone brought a disposable camera and snuck away to the gym when nobody was using it during lunch break. This was in the 1990s, so not much teacher supervision. A week later, he came back with the developed photos. They were blurry and grainy and not all that good because he was 10. But it was still enough. What was seen was even shocking. The legends were true. 
There was a basement under the gym floor, and inside the gym storage room, there was a door to a boiler room, and inside the boiler room there was a staircase that led to the basement. Inside the basement, there's what appeared to us kids at least, torture equipment, whips, chains, racks, just as described. The kid showed his parents, who of course brought the photos to the school staff, demanding to know what the deal was. The photos, of course, weren't good enough quality to see what the stuff was, so there were questions. The staff investigated and eventually brought us all to the gym for an assembly about the photos, which we all had either seen or were told about by other people. The school basement was stored from where the building used to be, the city's high school more than 40 years ago. The school used to weigh benches, which explains the racks, for some sport teams. The school also had a very successful horse riding team who would go to competitions. There also used to be a horse barn on the property, but it'd been torn down. This explained all the whips, ropes, and there were also saddles and other horse equipment. I don't remember all the details as this was 20 years ago. They showed us some of the stuff that was down there, and then all the rumors were put to rest. But the legend of elementary school dungeon cemented itself in school history. There was an urban legend at my high school that one of the janitors quit because he saw a set of bloody footprints down the hallway. My bad, that was me. One day, I was staying late to complete a class project and dropped a heavy glass pane on my toe. It left a huge gash that I couldn't get to stop bleeding. Now, my school was kind of the place where having a shoe full of blood would get you weeks detention instead of a hospital visit. So I made sure to check around before I limped on home to bandage myself up. Our high school was rectangular with a sunken library in the middle, so we had hallways that framed it. I was at one corner and at the end was the janitor finishing up mopping the hallway. As soon as he turned the corner, I took off my shoes and socks, since there was so much blood, I couldn't properly walk, and walked down the hallway out the door. This left a perfect trail of bloody footprints until the hallway dried out, which happened to be exactly where the exit door was. As the rest of the story goes, he turned around when he heard the door close and found a trail of bloody footprints down the hallway, with no one there to take responsibility. The dude quit on the spot. The Green Man, Charlie No-Face, on the outskirts of Pittsburgh near where Piney Fork empties into Peters Creek, there's an old neglected railroad tunnel covered in graffiti and filled with road salt. It was built in 1924 as the Piney Fork Tunnel to surface coal mines along the Pennsylvanian Railroad Peters Creek Branch. It was abandoned in 1962, and the locals have given it another name. To many people in the Pittsburgh area, this is the Green Man Tunnel. Teenagers used to drive into the tunnel, turn off their lights and call out to the Green Man, who would appear from the darkness, his skin tinged green from a tragic electrical accident. If he touched your car, his electrical charge would either stall the vehicle or make it difficult to start. Teenagers looking for a good scare still head out to the area at night, hoping to catch a glimpse of the Green Man, but they won't find him. He passed away over 20 years ago, but he wasn't a crazy lunatic or a ghostly apparition. His name was Raymond Robinson. I grew up near a small town known as Lake Eliza. It's mainly comprised of redneck homes grouped around the said lake. The story was, when the area was first established, the lake was originally named Fish Lake. There was a couple that owned one of the first houses to be built along the lake before being able to start a family that husband died from unknown causes. The wife, Lady Eliza, grew very depressed after passing of her husband. The only time anyone would see her is when she would take her dog out for a walk on the lake during wintertime when everything was frozen over. One of the times she never returned home from her walk. When locals went searching for her, they found a hole at the center of the lake where she had presumably fallen under. They then changed the name of the lake to Lake Eliza in memoriam. Over the years, her house remained the only one still standing. It's now directly across from Town Hall and has a nice path down to the lake. A lot of people claim the house to be haunted by her ghost, which is fun. That's not the real urban legend though. It is, however, the urban legend that drew me and my friends into checking it out. 
my friends and I and our teams were obsessed with ghost hunting. We checked out all the haunted places in our area. Gypsy's Graveyard, Circus Trainwreck, Salsi and Prep School, and we even looked for Diana of the Dunes. We partied at all the sites and never saw a thing. Nothing faced us until we went to see Lady Eliza's house. We went out there at night. There was six of us. A few stayed behind in the car that we were too chicken to check it out. I and three other friends decided to check it out. The front door was boarded up, but we noticed the nearby window was exposed. We climbed in through the window and immediately the smell hit us. We were not quiet about it, which, in hindsight, was very dumb. We ventured in through the living room. One of my friends decided to wander and nobody thought anything of it. He did not get very far. Far from the edge of the living room was a staircase in a hallway and across from that kitchen. My friend took one look into the kitchen and turned pale. He shined his flashlight at us to get our attention and said, We have to go now! Our first reaction was to laugh at him, but the chance to mock him was quickly interrupted by, What the duck? That came from upstairs. We booked it out, jumped into the waiting car and told them to GTFO. While driving away, we noticed an Escalade that came from the opposite direction pull up to the house. Lake Eliza is also not too far of a drive from a city that we'll just say used to hold the murder record in the US. The rumor was that gangbangers would take victims in this house, drop them there. We did not hear about this rumor until after the encounter. What my friend saw, and what I swear I caught a glimpse of when we were leaving, was several dead bodies lined up across the kitchen floor. We had stumbled upon the gangbangers at the worst possible time. The house may not have been haunted, but it sure as hell scared the piss out of me and my ghost debunker friends. From then on out, my friends and I have natural distrust for Escalades and will ridiculously duck and hide if we see one cruising by. There's a bridge near where I grew up in Bum Duck, Tennessee that's notorious for screaming at people at night. The screams aren't audible to the house nearby, and supposedly, you have to sit on the actual bridge to hear it at all. Though, I haven't tested it or anything. The common explanation is that it's a bobcat that lives under the bridge, but people have checked with dogs and such and never find signs of any. Well, some friends and I heard this story for years all growing up but never tested it. So one night after a few beers, we get up the notion we're going to test this thing out. So, five drunk guys pile into a beat up car and drive down to the park on the bridge. This is 1.30 a.m. and it's dead silent. We sat there for a good 45 minutes, nothing happened. We had the windows down and had started debating whether or not it was all bullshit. When the scream happened. We had the lights off and there was a moon so you could see pretty well. And there for sure wasn't anything outside the car, but it was so loud and it sounded just like a woman with a particularly powerful lungs having her skin ripped off right outside the window of the rear passenger side that faced the edge of the bridge. Now, I've heard bobcats in heat while hunting, and they do scream, scream, scream kind of thing. It's hard to describe, but they do it in little repeating bursts. This was a good three to four second extended scream at incredible volume. We tore out of there like a demon was chasing us. A couple miles down the road, we finally stopped and processed what happened. My adrenaline was going so badly, and I was scared. I was just shaking uncontrollably. One of my friends peed himself, which I've never seen anyone do. One friend immediately left the car and vomited. To give what I think was a good frame of reference of how terrifying this was, my friend whose car we were in wasn't even mad at the friend that pissed all over his seat. It was insane. To this day, I have no explanation for that scream. I don't think it's a well-known urban legend or it's even considered one. But one of my best friends went to a college up in eastern Ohio and claimed that there was this back road out in the woods where really weird things would happen to your car. I was up there visiting one weekend and we decided to get some snacks and drinks. Some of our other friends came with us. This was probably 1 a.m. or so. On the way back, we made a detour to go drive on the road my friend told us about. We were driving along for almost the entire length of the road nothing has happened. Then, 
Right as we pulled up to the stop sign at the end of the road to head back, the engine shut off. All the interior lights came on and the door slid open. It was a Ford minivan. Naturally, we're freaking out, but after we calmed down a bit, we decided to loop back and try it again. After doing this twice, we discovered that it would only happen if the vehicle came to a complete stop. We did a slow and go at the stop sign. Nothing happened. I still have no explanation for this and haven't seen anything about it online. Crazy stuff. I live in a lower middle suburb in a large city in the middle of America. Plenty of religious people, but for whatever reason, not many superstitious people. My buddy grew up in the nicest neighborhood in the suburb with his parents and always jokingly told about the lights in the haunted house across the lake. He was a huge jokester and nobody took him serious, even enough to ask for an explanation. Was at his house working on a project one night and he says something like, the lights are going on and off again. I asked for clarification. He pointed towards the window at the house across the small lake on the hilltop. I'd seen the house many times previously, and although it was on the small lake his house sat on, the entrance to the property was actually from another direction, probably a mile away. I asked what was the significance about the light. He said, there was a house fire five years prior that gutted a large portion of the interior while killing the family that slept. He said the house had not been remodeled and it had no power. Probably a year later, a small group of us were little intoxicated on a Saturday night and decided to go visit the house and find out once and for all if it had power. We endlessly debated this because it wasn't flashlights you occasionally saw. It was truly a lit house. The property had a very long, windy drive from the road, probably a mile or so, and the property was unkempt, and the grass four feet tall. As we got probably halfway to the house, and a vehicle, thank God, we encountered a very aggressive wolf standing in the middle of the road who seemingly did not want us to pass. It was extremely alarming because none of us had seen a wolf up close, and it just wasn't something you expected to encounter so close to a big city. After some light flashing and engine revving, we were able to scare it away. We arrived at the home, which was completely trashed and unkept without further incident. The home had been broken into previously because the door hung from its hinges and was easy to push aside. The inside was incredibly creepy because not only was it an abandoned house, but was just as it's been when the fire swept through and we all knew the inhabitants died from where we were standing. We looked around for a bit and then remembered our original mission, power. We gathered around what appeared to be undamaged switch and mostly undamaged part of the home. We flipped the switch on and nothing. Immediately, we all made eye contact because we were all feeling the same way. The best way to describe it, an ice cold wave of dread and almost hatred ran all over us. It was almost a repulsed feeling and we felt we should not be here. Without hesitation, we walked to the front door and left. I'm not superstitious or anything like that, not even religious, but there was something in that house and it did not want us there. We never really talked about it again and did not tell anyone. I had almost forgotten about it until I visited my friend who was in the town visiting his parents just a couple months ago. I shit you not, the lights were on in the house. When I was in high school, my freshman year history teacher told us that she was growing up in the area. There were rumors of satanic cults. She told the class that they even had some sort of temple or something that got taken down. I don't think anyone believed her. The high school was in a pretty affluent suburb of Illinois. Years later, during the summer I had graduated from high school, I was at a friend's house and we decided to check out the woods in his backyard because he said, there was an abandoned shed back there. We found the shed had been severely damaged by storms over the years. As we kept walking to the end, upon a dead-end street lined with houses, the last two houses on the street were boarded up and not occupied. One of those houses had a window open in the back with a small step stool placed on it. I was curious to see what was inside, so I climbed through the window while my friend waited outside. The window I climbed in through was a bedroom window. The walls of the bedroom were covered in graffiti. It was very vulgar. At first, 
I thought it was just a bunch of religion-hating kids because Jesus and God came up a lot in the vulgar graffiti. As I made my way through the house, I went first into a bathroom down the hall. The bathroom was also covered in the same vulgar graffiti, but also had torn up pieces of paper littering the floor. When I picked up some of the paper, I noticed that they were all pages of the Bible. I left the bathroom and went into the living room, and there was a huge pentagram spray-painted on the wall, in addition to the vulgar graffiti that seemed to be on every wall of the house. At that point, I got my friend who was waiting outside to come in. He was in shock that this house was so close to his, and he wasn't really up for exploring, but I wanted to keep looking around. Eventually, we found an attic. I went up to the steps of the attic. In the attic, there was a goat. I'm assuming it was a goat. It was a skull on the floor in the attic, in the middle of another painted pentagram. After seeing that, we both left the house. A couple months later, it was demolished. Congratulations, you survived 11 creepy urban legend stories. If you enjoyed any of these stories, you'll love the content here on Midnight Monster, where we cover topics ranging from unexplained mysteries to serial killers to terrifying night stories. Subscribe if you think you can handle the scare. <laughs>